Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church's Bible Study. I'm here in the village of Harlem in the city of New York. Um, we are at www.stjamesharlemnyc.org. If you want to check us out, donate, give us a comment, or so on and so forth, you can get all of our email information there as well. But we're going to dive into our lectionary readings for this Sunday, April 30th, 2023, which is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Now, even while we were in the period of Lent, I think we also had the 23rd Psalm as part of our um, lectionary studies, but here it is again. Here we are now on the fourth Sunday of Easter. We are having the, the, the Lord is my shepherd as Psalm 23, as we are celebrating a lot of the qualities of shepherds and being a shepherd that Jesus sort of brought to bear um, in the Gospel of John, we'll see that as well. So we're just going to delve right into this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As we know, many of us know, it's such a prayer for us anyway, that it will be our opening prayer. Um, and if you remember Antoinette, you know, she talked about it when she was in a dangerous situation she felt in New York City. She said that and God sort of was there with her. So let us hear this tonight and see how it plays out for us this time. Because each time we read God's word, um, we pray that the spirit reveals something new to us. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We'll just go through a few of these notes and know that this is again, repeat some of the notes that said this is a song of trust and those seemingly idyllic evil lurks at the margin and nature is sometimes dangerous. Verse four, the darkest valley. In an agrarian society like ancient Israel, Israel herding would be familiar to everyone. There's also the subtle allusion to the Exodus traditions of the divine shepherd guiding Israel through the wilderness. There are two distinct images of God, the shepherd, and the host of the banquet, and two grammatical persons used um, of God, he, in verses one through three, and you in verses four through six. Again, we were reminded that shepherd is a favorite title of near ancient kings, connoting compassionate care. Um, this is something that would be not for many emperors, but for many kings who were supposed to be there for their people. Um, in, near East, in the Near Eastern places, they looked at their kings as being their caretakers and their shepherds. And verse one can actually be paraphrased this is because the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. So when you say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. There's nothing that I lack. Um, the still waters, once again, the not swiftly running so that sheep can keep their footing as they drink from the pool, um, so on and so forth. I love this line and we'll come back to that, the restoring of the soul. Um, verse five, the image of the shepherd changes to the host, as we said. The Lord's invitation to dine vindicates the psalmist as just. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, where the enemies are excluded um, as not sort of being invited firsthand to the table and our head being anointed with oil. Um, if we've spoken about David being anointed and Solomon being anointed and kings being anointed. The fact that God would anoint our heads, our very, our very heads um, with oil 
shows that there is a, a work that we are called to do for God as well, that we are set aside by God, um, just as those people were. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Um, replacing the enemies in pursuit, goodness and mercy pursue us all the days of our life. And I remember us talking about that the last time, and I'm so overjoyed with that. Um, lead me beside the still waters, lie down in green pastures. Um, lead me beside the still waters, restores my soul. There's no commentary for that. There's no extra thought to that, but I was just thinking about how powerful that is in our hectic pace of a world that when we are, even when you're leading shepherd sheep out and you're taking them out to pasture, you're usually walking them and walking them and moving them through these weird terrains and so on and so forth. And you get to the pastures and you can finally start to eat, you get to drink. And for some reason, your energy and your peace comes back. And that is akin to having your soul restored. I think of myself after coming out of this fasting period of what it is, is like when you're, when you're going through, especially in the beginning of the fast and you're wondering, what am I gonna eat? What am I gonna eat? And then all of a sudden you do eat and it's not about the food. There's something about it that just sort of, and it's probably your blood sugar, <laughs> it calms you and you get back into a sense of, of oneness with, um, with yourself and with God. The rest restoration of the soul is something I want us to just think about and ponder as we move forward and move from this place. So what are some of your thoughts that you heard this time as we heard this familiar song? I think I heard this time, I, I really heard a sense of uh, comfort and, you know, and whatever challenges that I'm thinking, um, he protects me. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, there's a place of, of um, divine protection that it reminds me, you have that. You have, you know, with him a place that as tired as you may get and all you know, what you do that he, you know, his word provides rest, which is why I'm here till 630. But, um, <laughs> so that's what I saw this time. Okay. And I'll just follow along with that whole protection message. You know, I am um, <clears throat> living, living in New York, you know, you're, you're alone a lot. And, you know, you're, you're crossing the street. I think the reason why I was hit by a bicycle was because I was kind of alone and distracted and all that. Mm -hmm. But what I had in my mind, what I pictured was somebody grabbing me by the hand mm -hmm. and, walk, okay, come on, you know, <laughs> let's go. I'm here. I'll guide you. Uh, and I'll be with you across the street or, uh, you know, in the pasture or um, with your enemies or whatever it is. I'm here to hold your hand and guide you. And, um, I've always been puzzled a little bit, not puzzled, that's probably not the right word, but the still waters and the green pastures, um, it, it's a calming kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it goes before the restoring your soul because you yeah. know, you, you get, you, you're guided and then, mm -hmm. okay, so now we're gonna start the, the calming <laughs> period mm -hmm. and you go to the green pastures first and then you go to the still waters next and then, you take a deep breath, you exhale into the restoration of your soul. You know what I love about what you just said that is that you, you really focus on the semicolon. Yeah. You know, we get, we, we get taken to, we get to lie down in the green pastures, we get led beside the still waters, but then we realize oh, he did all of this to restore my soul. Yeah. <laughs> There's the realization, that's beautiful. Thank you, Andre. Yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm. This is really beautiful. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is comforting. Mm -hmm. And I am just, I am just shocked that every that this particular time in this season in my life, in this season of scriptures I've been reading, this lectionary, that there is just this overwhelming presence of God. Mm. It's like from the very beginning. It's like just naming the Lord as your shepherd. It's like it means that God is always present if I'm the sheep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. always present somewhere there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that presence is like part of that comfort. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's also a declaration in the first three verses. Mm. And, then, and then it becomes personal after that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for you are with me. You are yeah. with me. Right. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting how you point out the difference in the in those, you know, in the two how they how they mention it, it in him in two different ways. It's like two different characters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stand in a way, and then I'm right there. <laughs> you know, so I think mm -hmm. you know it makes you look more closely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you um, learn a little about um, sheep and farming, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of puts this uh, psalm in perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of follow some homesteaders. Um, mm -hmm. And I became aware that um, a lot of modern homesteaders use a type of dog called a guardian mm -hmm. dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, generally, they're white furred animals, and they live outside. They they never come in the house. They're not house pets, and they patrol and guard all the farm animals at night, especially. Mm -hmm. And um, when a farmer hears a dog, the dog bark. He knows that something's going on, mm -hmm. and. Uh, usually the dog has it under control, you know, mm -hmm. before the farmer ever gets out there with, with their gun, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when I, every time I read this Psalm, it just brings up different images, you mm -hmm. know, that we're just like helpless. <laughs> we're helpless, mm -hmm. you know, like sheep. Mm -hmm. Like sheep. And uh, we, we need that protection. And we have that protection, whether we want it or not. We have it. Yeah. I just wanted to. I'm I'm just getting in from work, but um, so I'm catching the tail end of this. But um, I mean, the 23rd Psalm is one of my favorites. But um, this might be kind of an aside, but from my days back to Sunday school. The two things that I always, all that always stuck with me, and, and you know, we learned it very, very young, was the twenty-third Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And it just seems, no matter how old I get, <laughs> there's a place for both of those. It's some, some moment in time. It's like you know, the three or four-year-old that learned these things. Those two things still stay in my soul when I'm afraid or I'm frightened or I, mm -hmm. I feel I'm, I'm, you know, don't have what I need. So it's, they're both very, very comforting. And I think um, if you learn them and that's instilled in you as a very young child, your brain almost automatically will go there. Mm -hmm. It can't go there mm -hmm. if it's never been trained or taught. But um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, as, as a teenager or a young woman, I have gone back to both of those in times that I felt I needed to pray. Amen. Yeah, we spoke about your story before, before you came online as well, when you were walking and when you were on that um, encounter with that gentleman. Anyway. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I learned that psalm, you know, in Sunday school. You know, so it was instilled in me early, the knee jerk reaction, look to God, look to God, look to God. It, I didn't even have to think about it. My, you know, as soon as I felt unsafe and threatened, that five or six year old in me immediately went to what I had been taught and had been instilled in me. God is there for you. And that was taught very, very young. And I think so got many me, of our it, children it, are missing that. Yeah, and it got me in really good, like I mentioned to you all before when we started studying Shakespeare, because, you know, I was reading King James Version of the Bible, and it, I already knew iambic pentameter because I've been reading, you know, all the Psalms, which is in that same language. So I knew where all the accents went and all that stuff with Shakespeare, and they asked me why, and I said, because I know the Lord's I know the I know the twenty uh, third Psalm, and I was able to quote the twenty third Psalm in class to show them the parallel between um, the iambic pentameter and Shakespeare, 
and the Amit Pentameter in, in the King James Version of the 23rd Psalm. It never leaves you once, once it's, been, it's been taught, especially young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many biblical allusions when you're teaching classics. And it makes it very challenging when you're teaching them because a lot of the children don't have the yeah. uh, biblical foundation. So then you have to go back and teach the, the you know, I mean, you're not supposed to. You actually do have to go back and teach it because yeah. otherwise they won't. They, you know, they missed that because they didn't have that, you know, they didn't have that understanding of either the character, the saying, the word. The, so that, you know, I mean, in the classics, not necessarily in, in more modern literature, but definitely in the classics, mm -hmm. it's peppered with them. Yeah. So. And I remember when my, no, I was just going to say when my mother was in the hospital and um, they, um, since she's older, <clears throat> they can't find her veins very easily, you know, for IVs and so forth. And it was really painful for her, you know, and she started to recite the Lord, the, the 23rd Psalm mm. automatically, you know, and it was so powerful for me just standing there listening. Mm -hmm. And, and exactly. I think it gave her comfort through her pain, you know, yes. um, what a lesson from somebody who, like you say, Antoinette, she learned it when she was three <laughs> and she's about to turn 101. This was probably when she was 98 or so, um, but it still is a, still there. It, it, right, still a protection. It's still know? a protection. Yeah. Very comforting. Yeah. It is. And just Linda, I know that you have to go and we'll be here when we talk yeah. about the John text, but um, okay. there's an allusion to Jesus being, it's the text of Jesus being the good shepherd, John 10, 1 through 18. Okay. Um, and just one note to hear is that when Jesus <coughs> talking, when John is talking about, you know, the stranger will, will allow um, the wolf to come in and run away because the stranger is afraid, but the shepherd will not. And there's a great distinction between um, just the, the farm hands that sort of work for the shepherd and the shepherd. And the shepherd. There is a difference when we yes, move yes. into the gospel and there's a difference for us in our lives to understand yes. that there are those who, that, that the Lord is our shepherd and that there are some that work for the Lord that will run away when the wolves are, when the wolves are at bay. Yes. <laughs> and in, yes. in the gospel of john jesus is talking about the scribes and the pharisees so i just wanted to leave you with that before you okay everyone have a very day. blessed night i'm sorry i have to leave you really too. sorry but anyway have, have a, a great blessed. interview give sherry and a I'll you on youtube yeah. bye -bye. Okay. Okay. Thank you. all righty thank all you oh, bye okay bye and happy birthday reverend pond oh, thank you happy birthday Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> She's trying to stay in the Lord. The Lord brought her here for her. The Lord brought her in the world. The Lord can take her out. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to our first reading. Um, our first reading is, once again, not from the Old Testament, but it's also from the book of Acts. They usually do this. Um, during this time period before Pentecost, um, but I'll always remember that this is a this is coming right after our text from last week. But in the beginning of Acts two, um, Acts one, Jesus ascends. Act two um, is when the Holy Spirit. Acts two is when the Holy Spirit comes, and this is all right after the Holy Spirit has come. But we're not celebrating that part until Pentecost later on. So, but this is about the life in the first Christ community. And there is a notation that they put beautifully in, the, in this um, particular edition of the Bible. Uh, the terms Christian and Christianity are used here for convenience, but strictly speaking are inaccurate for the time portrayed in the narrative. Luke knows the term Christians, but does not adopt it as his own designation for believers. Most people were um, known as Christ followers or followers of the way. Um, and in this particular scripture, um, we really are speaking about those 3,000 plus people who are also Jewish people and the, pe and the Jewish people who are in Jerusalem at the time. But this Christ follower community, 
they are they are Judeans who follow the way. That is what they are politically, because they live in Judea. They don't. It, Rome does not consider them um, Israelites or Hebrews. He, Rome considers them Judeans because they live in Judea. <laughs> period. It is not the nation of Israel; it's the land of Judea. And so they are Judeans who practice Judaism, who follow who follow Yah, Ju, Judeans who follow Yahweh, who are now also looking at this other aspect of of their religion, where they are following the way and the teachings of this man named Jesus, and Christians um, being used outside of the context of the of the community of Christ followers is a pejorative term. It's not a good. It's not a good thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, those Christians. Just so that we are aware that this is what we're talking about. But this is the first church, the first, the first, not church, the first community of folks that gathered. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about the context, context of this, but let's just read these five verses very quickly. So after Paul preached, and 3,000 people came as they were baptized and they said, what should we do? And he said, repent. And then they were baptized to receive the Holy Spirit when it would come. Then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This, in our Emmaus text last week, Jesus was known in the breaking of the bread, um, as he as he said the prayers and was in the breaking of the bread. What ends up happening here is that we're now starting to see that this is a term and an idea that is sort of like following all the way through, but it's not just the Lord's Supper. It's the, it's the Christian meal. It's the meal, it's the meal that they eat together and the Lord's Supper. So anytime that they get together and that they have a meal, they all come together and have a meal. They talk about their prayers. They talk about things that are going on in the community and they, they have the Lord's Supper and all of that is a breaking of the bread. It's all part of one big beautiful moment um, in which they share with one another. Um, Luke portrays life in the early Jerusalem community as a golden age. It's a portrayal of a golden age to provide a moral lesson for his own readers and a moral lesson for us. Can we imagine if everything that we did, we shared, we distributed as all needed, spent time together in our sanctuaries, breaking bread and eating food with glad and our hearts were generous and we had the goodwill of all people in our, in our, as our intentions? Can you imagine the amount of, and, and especially thinking about the people who are being oppressed by a, an, an empire who are the 99% who've never had enough food, never had enough bread, this simple idea of sharing and, and, and having the goodwill of everyone in their community together has relieved a tremendous true burden of poverty and, and hunger for the people who end up following the ways of Christ. And they don't join because they're just getting fed and having everything taken care of. Um, Luke really wants us to know that it's because of the goodwill and that sense of community that they're in. Um, and by performing wonders and signs, um, they use those phrases specifically because um, wonders and signs, um, the apostles are fulfilling Joel's prophecy in, in Joel 2.19, and they're also imitating Jesus. Remember, you're, you're, you will perform signs and wonders. Your old shall, your old shall dream dreams, and your young shall have visions. Um, 
it's actually happening now. So the apostles are actually fulfilling that. Verses 44 through 45, the ideal use of possessions and money illustrates the proper response to the preaching of Jesus on this subject in the gospel. And there are many, many things, many, many quotations that they have um, that when Jesus is talking about how to deal with money and how to deal with possessions, they are actually now preaching and living in response to how Jesus preached it in the gospels. Community goods are also spoken of in the Dead Sea Scrolls, other communities that are known to have followed Christ. And they're also um, in the, in described in the writings of Josephus and his writings on the Essenes. Um, or other people that sort of gathered together out in the wilderness and, and lived an ascetic lifestyle, but lived according to some of the, um, the, the ways of Jesus and the way that Jesus was speaking as well. But Josephus, it's important to, for us to know that this is being verified um, in this text because Josephus is an actual um, noted uh, Jewish historian for Rome. He told the story of Jewish people in the first century um, for the Roman people. So he sort of told it from uh, a Roman perspective, but he was he was he wasn't an actual historian, and we still have many of his writings. So the stuff that I'm listing here, Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus writings, I can give you chapter and verse for those actually, um, where he's writing about. Um, how these positions, possessions and the use of money um, is this proper response and how it was being done by the people at that time period. Just to let you know, day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, this is to also make us aware that members of the growing quote unquote Christian group are simultaneously devout Jews who remain close to the temple. So they are Jews for Jesus. Um, so this is, this is where we're at in the very beginning of the first community. They're still high on this whole idea of the Holy Spirit. They're still sort of eager and fresh and new. Um, and this is what I like about the book of Acts personally. Um, in studying the New, the New Testament, it's before they would decide who was in and who was out. It's while they were still waiting actively for Jesus to come back. Jesus had just ascended up to heaven and said, I will come back and lo, I'll be with you till the end of time. Yeah, and then the Holy Spirit comes, but they're like, okay, Jesus went up to heaven. The Holy Spirit is here now and Jesus is coming back. So let's all come together and wait. So this is actively how people are living while they're waiting for Jesus to come back. Not in the great by and by, but right here and right now. And the, and the side note for that is that many of the other writings that are done, not Paul's writings, but the writings that are done in the name of Paul, the writings that are done in the name of Peter, some of these other writings that are done and like for like John 1, 2, and 3, Jesus hasn't come back yet. So now it's like we have this community. Now we've got to put some rules and regulations and some parameters around it that start to say who can be in and who can be out and what happens and, and you know, who gets sort of taken care of, who doesn't get taken care of. When people start giving a lot of money and wanting their names on Jewish synagogues that they're Christ followers, what that all means, things start to get diluted. But this is the moral lesson that Luke, the writer of, of Acts, wants us to really understand that this is the intention of the beloved community um, of Acts in these five verses. <laughs> Your thoughts? You know, when I when I heard this, uh, heard you reading this, the first thing I thought about, and this, this is probably sacrilegious, but <laughs> I thought of cults mm -hmm. and how people can gather together um, and 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 um, lose reality on some level um, in in a cultish way. 
Um, and, and I, you know, cause I kept thinking about it again and reading it again. And, and I thought it could be real or it could be, um, contrived for somebody's agenda, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it is contrived for somebody's agenda, which is Christ's agenda, <laughs> the agenda that is being set up for Christ to come back, in fact. But I could see yeah, ways. I, I had the same thought. I was like, <laughs> this sounds like a cult. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but know. it's not a toxic cult. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Exactly. It's not like the cults that we know of. Exactly. You know? Right. Which um which is kind of interesting because when, when we hear of cult behavior, we compare that behavior against the early church hmm. and how the early church functioned. And we always see that there's, it's wanting, you know, hmm. because there's like this idol worship of one person who's authoritarian in the nature and controls everybody. But in the early church, that wasn't happening. Mm. That didn't come until was later. Like working to help one another. They weren't uh, worshiping one individual who, you know, took advantage of them. Right, right, right. And, and also to, to remember that um, the way that we have come to understand cults um, was actually cultic religions and cultic ways of understanding um, how to be in community were very standard in the first century. Every single god in the pantheon uh, of Rome um, had its followers, mm. had its cult, had mm. its, you know, a Dionysian cult were, were orgiastic wine drinkers who would celebrate and that, that was who they, that was what they did. And that's, that's how they found themselves in community, supplying things and being there with one another. You know, every single one of those gods had, had a temple um, mm. in one of these, in, in a one town or another. And so these cults, so this is like you're saying, this is once again, um, Christ's example of how to be in community goes against the grain of what even those cults are of the time. So it's very interesting that you all picked up on that. And still day by day, the Lord added to their number. I'm just that the, the Jews must have felt that they were a cult. <laughs> The ones that weren't converting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, could um, the last, the last um, sentence where it says goodwill for all people, could that have made them um, different from a cult? Um, where the last sentence, having the goodwill of all the people. Yeah. The people that was in the cult. I mean, <laughs> just the followers of Christ. Yeah, well, uh, and also, Genevieve, you make a really good point there because um, the the trajectory and and the intention of Peter and the disciples is still very much that this is for the chosen people of God. So all the people are all the people that are the chosen people of God, which would be, you know, the Jewish people and even those people that turn Jesus over, um, that the goodwill of God is for all God's people. This is still about redeeming Israel, redeeming God's people. Oh. It's still about okay. that. And it's still about bringing everybody into the fold. However, the book of Acts and the book of Luke are both um, also intended to sort of give us that through line that it's also about Gentiles. So it's, it's laying the groundwork here, having the goodwill of all the people. It's laying the groundwork in the beginning of Acts for what's about to happen with Paul and other people who are saying, well, let's just include everybody and figure out that Christ is really speaking for everyone. And Luke is the writer of the gospel, the gospel writer that sort of lays that tract out from the gospel and finishes out finishes out in Acts. Because didn't Jesus say that he had sheep that were not of this 
That's coming. That's coming up in a little bit, but it's mm -hmm. specifically. Um, I want to specifically tie this to Luke, even though it's going to be alluded to when we get into our gospel lesson in John. Mm -hmm. um, but Luke is really specific about not specific, specific, but like he doesn't say, well, now it's time for Jesus said this about the Gentiles. But Jesus is always sort of reaching out and saying, I have more to do because God's the even the intention of the of the israelites when they went into the promised land there are two strands of belief one in the book of um in the book of joshua you'll see that one of them is to say we stephan can you help him downstairs a little yeah, bit yeah. Uh, and one of them is the um the strand that you go in, you kill everybody, and you conquer and the other one is is like go in and convert people and bring them to yahweh <laughs> you know, so, but it's about who takes, who, which one takes precedent from what people want to believe and where people are. But it really is a whole sense of, sense of being that like, no, we really are supposed to be sharing all of God's goodwill and God's graces with everyone who will say yes and everyone who will hear it. It's about the benefit of all people, especially when you're in a, when you're in a, in a, in a, in a Roman empire where everybody else who was conquered is less than, than the Roman citizen. So you've got the good news for everybody. And Paul takes that and revs it up 100%. We, we're still struggling with that. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like, remembering that, you know, you observed Ramadan, you know, the fast of Ramadan. And I have a cousin who's a Christian who also does the same thing. Um, I, I, I was thinking the other day, I said, isn't this kind of odd? I said, you have the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians all celebrating the same time. Um, <laughs> related um, observances. And I said, you have the chosen people of God and you have their half brothers and sisters in the Muslims. And then you have the adopted children of God in the Christians. <laughs> you know, we're all struggling. We're struggling to understand one another, to, to make it fit, you know? And all claiming the goodwill of the same God, actually. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just think how, how blessed Christians are because we were adopted. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. if we weren't, we'd just be out there. We'd just be out there. Mm -hmm. We'd still be worshiping Baal. <laughs> yeah. You know, like we'd be in, in the foster care system <laughs> oh lord the religious foster care system going from house to house oh boy but but luke really does want this ideal moralistic understanding of how to be in community um so that when people are thinking about when people are reading acts or, or acts is being read to them when they're in community and the breaking of the bread and the prayers and the singing of the hymns that they'll be like oh so this is what we're doing and this is this is what it is that we're supposed to do. And remember that this model was actually laid over um, into the associations, and the associations were like the guilds and uh, those people who were workers, like the carpenters, the bakers, the winemakers. They all had their own guilds, and they would meet in these guilds and in these guilds and associations. And this model of being a community actually morphed into um, into a, a similar thing of the guild so much so that the Roman um, the, the Romans were like, well, stop these guilds from forming because they're hiding out as Christians as and they're saying that they're guilds. <laughs> Pliny the, Pliny the Younger wrote a letter to the emperor and the emperor, he was asking them, would he be able to start a guild um, and an association for to put out fires because a, a group had wanted to put out fires and the emperor was like, no, because they're really trying to come together to be Christians. So it's very, 
But this model of how, hold on a second. Aaron, I'm in Bible study. I'll give you a call back, okay? Or I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right? Yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, bye. But um, this whole idea that this, this model would infiltrate even the existing systems that were going on in Rome, uh, which would be elite Romans, there would be slaves all together, but that's where the equality of, the equality of, uh, of community um, that were in the guilds and associations, because even a slave could be the president of a guild if they were a craftsman within that building, right? There was this like equality there. And that sort of actually meshed very beautifully um, as they went forward in this Christian model um, that we're looking at right now. So that's, but that's a whole other history lesson for another text at another time. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. You're welcome. Thank you. So, and now we go to First Peter. And this is, this speaks to a little bit more of what we're talking about as well. And First Peter, um, chapter 2, verses 19 through 25, verses 18 through 25, are actually instructions to slaves that lead to a more general comment addressed to a wider audience. Um, and for example, in chapter three, it's spoke, spoken of a little bit more. There's a lot of here. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy and love for one another or a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And though resembling typical household codes, which I've mentioned before, but don't have time to go into this evening, um, of the Hellenistic moralists, these household codes about the, the place of everyone, not just a mother or father and child, but the household, like the entire household of the mother or the father, the child, the slaves, the servants, blah, blah, blah. Everybody had their way of being um, in this particular household structure. And there were these codes that were set up that were that were sort of, um, that they sort of use and play with um, and building a lot of stuff on in, in a lot of these letters. But these Hellenistic moralists, the author's instructions are based, they, they lay these morals and these codes over on top of Christ's example because Christ suffered unjustly, right? And the words, and in these words that reflect the suffering servant is what we'll be reading in just a few moments. If you remember the suffering servant from Isaiah 53, 5 through 12, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All, all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. This writing of uh, Peter that we're finding here now, the writing of, uh, and that the, is a, a written in the name of Peter is coming now in the second century when there is much more um, hubbub about this Christian community and much more of a, of a, a political danger for what is happening. And so this first Peter is using the allusions to these particular texts in Isaiah, and we'll write about it more in the third chapter, 
to talk about instructions to slaves and to other Christians and others who are suffering. For it is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten down for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Um, as a 21st century person of color, I do have a little bit of issue with this um, being instructions to slaves <laughs> and how it has been read throughout history and how many people even now would, would want to read this particular text um, for um, the people that are under persecution by um, nationalists um, who are claiming Christianity. Um, as, as their brand of Christianity being the only brand of Christianity, that this would be a particular text that is harmful, um, telling people to suffer and to be in pain, but it's not supposed to be at the hands of Christians. <laughs> that's, why, that's why this doesn't work for modern slavery or for the transatlantic slave trade when we think about it. This is written for people who are Christ followers, who are being told that you cannot worship Christ, who are being told that you must give up. Um, you must give a, you must declare your, if, this is the example I love to use because it actually happened. You would have to um, pledge allegiance and give a toast to Caesar as God and drink that wine in order, because if you were a Christian, you would not do that because your communion, the cup that you take at communion is your preferential way of saying, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and this is the blood of his body that is for me. So I will not toast to another God. I will not drink for another God. And yet this was part of the trial that they had to go through. So this whole idea of suffering unjustly, all of this stuff is starting to percolate at this particular time period, um, this persecution. And they're trying to, I believe that there's a way that they're trying to tell people, come on, you're gonna suffer. But remember Jesus suffered all for the good. This is all for the good of our salvation, all for the good of God. So it's a credit to you because this had been language that had been used for slaves and now it's being hoisted onto Christianity. And remember what I said earlier, that this is now sort of like twice divorced from that time in Acts. It's twice divorced from 33 AD. This is now early part of, of um, the 100s. So this is like many, uh, two generations later, two, three generations later of uh, people, Jesus hasn't come, they're still suffering, there's still oppression, there's still poverty, there's still hunger, and they're still suffering from people treating you like dirt. So they're fusing now these Hellenistic moralist household codes um, to make it noble in our suffering under Christ. And even in verse 22, where it says he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. In Isaiah, there's a word, the word um, in that text is he committed no violence. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a big difference even in how this scripture is being quoted. And most likely the difference is because they are not reading from the prophets in Hebrew. They're reading from the Greek translation of the Septuagint. If you remember, Rome had the, the Hebrew scriptures translated by 70 scholars into Greek. And that was the Bible, the, the Jewish 
holy text that they were reading at the time, this translated text was the approved text. So what we see here in these variations um, are most likely um, something that would have been tweaked um, to go into Greek, mm -hmm. which would have been a total sort of understanding of the translation of how the words are translated from Hebrew to Greek. But also when there's translation, translators very often um, have their own take from their own cultural bias and how they call and how they translate things. Mm -hmm. He committed no sin. So it's not that he's in the, the suffering servant committed no violence and no deceit was found in his mouth. Here, that sin makes it seem like, oh, okay, he didn't do anything wrong um, that would have caused this to happen to him. Whereas the tradition of he did no vi he committed no violence um, would be in reaction to how the suffering servant was treated. But this sin means it's sort of like you get punished because you are a sinner. So there's a whole variation of this. But when he was abused, he did not return abuse. So you just have a little issue with it. But that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult sermon to preach on this because you, I would want to um, offer up that we are not called um, to suffer in, in the way that our, our world causes us to suffer now, that this scripture does not fit, there's not a one fit, all fits one purpose, you know, one size fits all scripture for this time period. Um, it is not just to be shot by the police. It is not just, you know, to be to be gunned down and run down and so on and so forth. It is not just to be economically disadvantaged and just to say, endure that while you suffer unjustly. Um, this is something something different about. There's a there's a different notion when we take it really under the auspices of saying. Well, Christ did this, and um, the good that comes from that is that we are beholden to God. We're not worried about what other people are doing. But as Martin Luther said, um, it was very clear that there is no reason that we that we take away the power of Jesus being on the cross and God being humiliated on the cross when we put ourselves or anyone else on the cross, because it was meant for Jesus to die to conquer. And by us doing this stuff and abusing and doing stuff unjustly, we're taking Jesus down off the cross and putting other human beings up on it. And that is not the purpose and that is not the glory of the good news of Christ. Well, you know, context is everything. And, you know, when you said, that the suffering didn't come from Christians, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I got kind of got stuck back there because <laughs> I was like, okay, so if you say you're a Christian and you're doing these things, oppressing people, you know, then there's something wrong with you. Well, Frederick Douglass, that's what he wrote about in his autobiography. He said, he says, yes, he said, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ following Christian. He said, I'm not a Christian of, um, it says American Christianity is not Christianity, you know, because he had a Methodist, a method, uh, his, one of his slaveholders converted to Methodism and only became cruel after he converted to Christianity. Wow. <laughs> It became cruel, cruel, cruel after he converted to Christianity. He said, that is not the Christianity that I follow. Mm -hmm. The American version of that Christianity is, is a heresy to Christ. So that's where that's another direction where I come from this at, Lisa, just so you know. Mm -hmm. She was just looking for a way to get out. Right there. So that's that's what that is. And I, I wonder whether this was sort of a um, a comforting rationale 
mm-hmm. people in slavery or enslaved back in in slavery times um when when they had no other justification that's probably not the right word but but it it kept them from going crazy basically because they could go back to this and say okay all right all right christ christ died without the without the the understanding or the the depth of understanding that christ is god and there's a very different uh relationship that christ had with god the father um, and I think that's the whole the whole thing that you're saying about Christianity. People became Christians. Not, I mean, not really understanding that it's not just Christ standing by himself for heaven's yeah. sake. You know, uh, it's it's a whole um, cadre of, tr- of Trinity. You know, <laughs> and and all that that means. And I I don't think they put all that together. Um, and they don't put together that the the idea in this particular text is that when you're waiting for Jesus to come back, is that because you profess Christ, you are the one that is set aside as holy. And that means something really deep and sacred, being sacred and holy and set apart means that you are in line with God who historically has said, I'm going to relieve you of that. And those who are doing the abusing and who are who are doing things unjustly, that, that cannot ever, that cannot ever be a bit, they can never have that avail to them. So if you are suffering unjustly, God still has your well being and your salvation at play. And if you become an abuser, if you do evil for evil, then you're going to the other side and you want to stay aligned with Christ. Um, so there's that as well that they're talking about. And that's what um, I think also became part of the distortion of Christianity. Um, for slavery and for oppression as we moved into the more modern times. It's like you deserve to suffer because you, you know, you don't really matter. But if you, if, if, if Christ is going to say it, then you should obey your masters. <laughs> so, yeah, it's ew, ew, ew. Right, exactly. too short of a time to have a conversation around that. This is the whole, <laughs> the whole series, the whole series, mm. but. So we'll just hold on to that and get to some good news in our gospel. (laughs) And hold on to that because I'm sure we're going to be revisiting some of this as we move forward through this lectionary year, this year. Um, Our our lectionary text is the gospel of John, um, John 10 verses one through 10, but I'm going to um, probably include verses um, all the way up to 18 because this is an entire discourse on the good shepherd and our, and our lectionary sort of cuts it off. So I'll do some analysis of one through 10 and then simply read how it makes more sense once you hear verses 11 through 18. It says, very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So verses one through six, the figure of speech, the Greek term paroimia, paroimia refers to the proverbial proverbial or metaphorical statement. John does not use the Greek term for parable or paraboli, 
for Jesus teaching, but these verses here that we're talking about are the, the in verses one through six are the closest that we'll find in the gospel of John to the parables in the synoptic gospels. When Jesus talks and tells a story and he has to sort of explain the meaning behind it, there's another meaning before it. Um, but in John 16, 25, he says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming where I no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. So Jesus is telling sort of like this metaphorical way of, and this proverbial way of talking about people coming in and stealing the sheep and so on and so forth. Um, he said, but I'm that sheep. The other voices have been thieves and they've been leading you out to kill you and to lead you astray. Um, the metaphorical language um, of verses one through two involves the gate and three through four involve the shepherd. Um, and verse five, they will not follow the stranger, um, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers once they know my voice. Verses seven through nine, the interpretation of the figure of the gate is that Jesus allows access to God. I am the gate for the sheep. And then verses 10 through 18 sort of is the interpretation of the figure of the shepherd. But here in verse 10, the shepherd we see is a frequent metaphor for God's care of Israel, as we spoke about at the very beginning in Psalm 23. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But let's just complete the notion of Jesus, the good shepherd. And then we'll hear about this, the thief and the hired hand. 11 says, I am the good shepherd. He makes it plain. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, um, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. This is a critique of the religious authorities around him. So he's really criticizing some folk. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, Lisa, to your point. Mm -hmm. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Um, those are the Gentile believers, those who um, are the those who are outside of the flock, talking about crucifixion, resurrection, and the power to lay it down. There's a notion, where is that at? Oh, that Jesus' death, in verse 11, he lays down his life for the sheep. It's voluntary, so it makes it noble rather than humiliating. So this nobility that is aligned now with this shepherd. Our lectionary wanted us to do verses one through 10. I think just because they really wanted to lift up and, and complete the whole of this notion of the shepherd um, from, from the first Psalm um, here with our gospel. And to sort of say we have access to God um, through the gate and through the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper is also the shepherd and that we are protected from those who um, others who climb in who do not belong and that there are wolves on the outside of every pasture, wolves on the outside of every farm um, and that the shepherd protects from that. Not even the hired hands will be able to protect because their lives will be more important because they don't own the sheep. And they, they don't- have no really vested do. interest in them. Exactly. Why did he feel he couldn't speak plainly when he speaks up, um, speaking to them plainly later on? You know, that, that notion of talking in parables and talking in metaphor and talking in, um, uh, it's not parables in John, I shouldn't say that. Um, but pre speaking proverbially and metaphorically, um, 
it's a method of, of teaching. It's a method of teaching and it's a method of drawing people into the story so that they can make some connections for themselves. And for Jesus, when they don't make the connection, he's like, okay, now I got to explain this to them. It, that happens in all of the gospels. Um, I think that's the, that may be why we sort of have this same sort of style in the gospel of John, which is not one of the synoptic gospels, but a separate gospel. But it's mostly because that's part of the way that you teach in the first century. Part of the way that you bring this kind of um, this kind of storytelling to life is to talk in metaphors and to talk in parables and say, "Do you get it? Do you get what I'm saying?" Okay, if you don't get it, I guess I better be make it more plain to you. That's one of the main reasons why in these texts they're written that way because it's it's a way of teaching and a way of learning from the gymnasia the schooling i read that i have that on my bookshelf the the schooling um the actually primer for students in roman schools and how these people that are writing these texts would have wanted Gentiles to understand this and other folk to understand this in the way of speaking up and lifting up the stories is by lifting up these metaphors and these and these um and these kind of proverbial metaphors to be able to say I need you to understand my point of view and to get it from this perspective this is the writer John's perspective I'm going to let you into this secret knowledge I am all of these things I am the shepherd I'm the gatekeeper I lay down my life for you and I can take it up again. I have that power. All of this is like this very, very direct, powerful knowledge of who Jesus is for the people um, in this particular text that's not in the synoptics, which became even clearer to me as I spoke it. So, so thank you, Antoinette. Other thoughts and ideas around this gospel of the good shepherd, the discourse on the good shepherd. I will say that it is important for us to think about this in our context, right? If we are the sheep that are in the fold, what does this say to us? There are others who are waiting to climb in who are not the keepers of the gate but are thieves and bandits mm. there are others who will say that they are hired hands doing the work of the good shepherd but will leave us out to dry so we have to be careful to whom we lay our allegiance and know that we go to the shepherd when there are others that are climbing in the gate that are thieves and bandits, we go to the shepherd, not the hired hands. We also have to be very careful to the voices that we listen to. Ooh, you better go ahead now. Yeah. Yeah. You better preach. <laughs> That's the sermon right there, Reverend Pond. <laughs> You know, but you know, having discussions with on politics in the past three years or four years, and you know, like re very recently, I was like really stunned by a friend of mine who's a Christian who really let it out that you know, like she's a supporter of certain conspiracy theories and everything, and I'm like. Who are you listening to? How could you be a Christian and listen to this stuff? You know, and uh, it's just what Reverend Pond said. We have to be careful who we're listening to. Oh, that wasn't Reverend Pond. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just giving. I was just giving Reverend Pond a prompt for for our sermons. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know who it was. I wasn't watching the screen. Oh. Yeah. But it's it's like how could you say you're a christian and then listen to to these voices the other thing about conspiracy theories and all the stuff that's going out on there politically it's sort of like i know some of the the things that 
I mean, even if these conspiracies, like, well, I'm going to speak from a first century perspective. Even if all of that stuff that we don't know for the facts, don't know for that are true, that they don't know the veracity of all that stuff that's going on, how is our lifting them up and fighting over them, laying it in the hands of God and asking God for clarity about how to proceed? Like we're, we're not talking about conspiracies to figure out how to make the world a better place. We're figuring about, we're talking about conspiracies so that we can separate ourselves into different camps to protect ourselves from one another, causing hate and disruption rather than pulling people together. Because to, I'm like, well, if there is a distraction, if there is a conspiracy, how is God calling us together to be in this world full of conspiracies? I want to live that way. I don't want to live like fighting and trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong because that's God will figure that out. And I know that God will lead me through this. I have faith that in that. But, you know, this whole idea about I'm going to fight this conspiracy theory, I'm going to believe this and I'm going to fight you online and I'm going to I'm going to watch Fox <laughs> instead of MSNBC and listen to these and I'm going to believe one over the other. It doesn't it doesn't feed into how God wants us to be in order to feed people, <laughs> to love people. You know, if there's a conspiracy afoot, it means that people aren't loving, people aren't feeding people, people are trying to do something to hurt people. And that's what conspiracies are. They're conspiracies to hurt people. And if they are conspiracies, then I'm anti-conspiracy only because I'm for God. <laughs> and then we go back to that first lesson that we read in Acts, mm -hmm. how, how the early Christians behave and i also that's, think too that's that, the we're, that we want to follow <laughs> and and we're listening to too much of that and not enough of the word right you know yeah so that the it's it's like having having friends that are going to tell you all the stuff you want to hear and not having the friends that are going to want you to be the best you can be and love you and and all of that i mean it's i would want to know of all these conspiracy folks are you still going to church and are you hearing the messages of god's love in church louder than you are hearing some of this other stuff um cuz i have a feeling that 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 the voices that are the loudest are the ones that are the conspiracy voices and they that, are yeah exactly so um yeah I, um, yeah saw so, uh, an interview with a psychiatrist the other day and she likened uh what we're calling voices <laughs> uh to a contagion mm. hmm. that's interesting yeah she said it's a contagion it is right Right. right. You know, the, the, if you think about it, you know, the rhetoric of Hitler mm. is all conspiracy. Right. Yes. And yeah. look at what happened. It was all conspiracy theory. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the contagion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mass hysteria is a, is a contagion, you know, and it's, it's a disease that goes about. You know, I, I'm a, and I'm like, you know, people talk about, I love the mo alien movies and thinking about, you know, Area 47 or whatever that place is and that there have been aliens here for years and years and years. But if they come in here on Sunday morning, I want to say, do you, <laughs> would you like to hear what we Earthlings really, the best thing about us Earthlings really are? It's the love that this man named Jesus Christ told us that we should have for one another. Do you all have any of that where you come from? That's what I'm going to say. I don't care about whether or not they're here. I'm going to tell them the good news. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of it is is peer pressure. I mean, you would think peer pressure ends as a teenager, but it doesn't. No, my God. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get on board or pretend to be on board because their neighbors, the people they work with, the, their managers at work or whatever, they, they feel like, well, I, I don't want to seem like the one that's not going along with this. Right. Right. Like they're back in, in junior high school or something. Right. And if you tried to ask them anything about the stuff they're espousing, they don't know anything about it. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They're followers. Yeah. <laughs> the bandits and the thieves. <laughs> and there's also the notion that, you know, 
they've taken the respectability politics of religion and plays it played it's being played out secularly in the world the respectability politics of of I always say in the 50s of standing on the steps of the church, shaking hands with the pastor on a Sunday and walking into a bank on Monday and your banker saying, oh, you were at that Presbyterian church. Why don't you come in back and we'll figure out how to get you that loan? I mean, that's how things used to be. But now the respectability politics are, if you don't believe what I believe about what happened on January 6th, then we're living in Iowa and you're not going to get any business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not going to have any friends. You're going to be on the outs and people are going to know what you think that you don't get along with us, that you don't agree with us. And we're going to say that because you don't agree with us, then you must love these people. You must be for these people, blah, blah, blah. All the people that we're against. And then that is like, well, I think maybe there might be something to it. <laughs> peer pressure. Well, I, I, I Adult about, peer pressure. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I think about Reverend D Dr. Charles Stanley, you know, mm -hmm. he was deep into scripture and, and gospel. And, you know, I, I grew up listening to him on the radio and TV and, you know, and I mean, he, he was of a, of a different uh, perspective in a lot of ways mm -hmm. than the, you know, Presbyterian perspective, but I never got from him that he was like, he would turn somebody away. Mm. I never got that from him. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, he was doing what they did in Acts then. <laughs> <laughs> You got the feeling that he was an ex church. Maybe that's an interesting thing. We Presbyterians um, are involved in this Matthew 25 initiative. You know, you saw me, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was, you know, naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And we've taken that up as a way. Maybe we should be an X2 church. <laughs> that's something. And not, for, and not forget that with all of that, we're supposed to be spreading the gospel as well. The good news. Yes. And all that conspiracy stuff is not good news. No, it's not. No. It's about as negative as you can get. So true. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it reminds me of Jesus on the mountain. You know, it's like the conspiracy theories, if we take away the word temptation, and just say, you know, the conspiracies of the devil to Jesus on the mountain. Well, you know, you know, nobody's going to want to follow you unless I can give you all these kingdoms, then they'll follow you. You have exactly what you want. Nobody wants to follow you We're talking about good and love and all that. That doesn't work in this world. That's a conspiracy, Jesus. You don't want to do that. Follow me. <laughs> and I also think about Jesus eating with sinners. Mm -hmm. The same people that these politicians are trying to write out of existence in the law. Well, I mean, he sort of sat down with trans people and sat down and ate with them. And what about the money that was stolen from the welfare people down in Mississippi? You know, oh, yeah, that that was money for food. And you wouldn't dare see a politician sitting down or even much less going to a food bank and sitting down mm -hmm. and having a meal with the same people that they're stealing that money from. That would mm -hmm. be that would be. Wow. Wouldn't I would love to see that happen because they would have a totally different perspective of all that crap. So it's, it's like back in the uh, 80s, I believe it was. Uh, some landlords were were um, sentenced to live in the very buildings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when they came out of it, they were like, "Oh my God, I got to do something about this building," you know. You know, and that you know that really is actually what changed King as well, because you know Malcolm X was for the city folk, 
and King was for all of the people who were down south and everywhere else and sort of like this this rhetoric that was sort of genteel for the nation. But it wasn't until he went to Chicago and lived in a housing project for a week mm. that he saw a mm. whole different aspect of a black American life. Wake up call. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's different than the one room schoolhouse in Marks, Mississippi, where the kids were barefoot and they had to walk across a wooden bridge that was full of mud and he got his, 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 the, the hem of his pants dirty and they had to share an apple and some bread between nine children that brought him to tears. It was different than living in that tenement in Chicago. It may have been tough, but it wasn't brutal. The project mm -hmm. was brutal. Yeah, yeah. Different ball game altogether. Well, my brothers and my sisters, it is that time. Andrea has another call. She loves the conversation. She said, stay in the faith, question mark, question mark. And I would say exclamation point, exclamation point. My brothers and sisters, we are here at our appointed time and God is with us. No matter what happens, whether we're talking about the abuse we suffer or we're debating what's happening in Peter, whether we're talking about how we're not, how we wish we could go back to the good old days of Acts 2, or whether we're just trying to recognize that what Jesus is really saying is the same as Psalm 23, when we know that the shepherd is with us and that God is present. Jesus is trying to tell these people with whom he's walking and talking, I am with you. And so he is with us. And